Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Melissa Mueller, and I am DWDC's Program Specialist. And I am joined today by my colleagues, Kelsey Goforth and Amanda coventry Barrage. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that while we are meeting virtually, the land Dying with Dignity is on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and we invite and, and encourage you to do your own research regarding the various treaties, in particular the land in which you are meeting uh, us today. And so today I am thrilled to welcome you to um, Grief 101, the fourth session of Dying with Dignity's Learning Center. Through this series, series, we aim to provide comprehensive information on several topics related to death and dying. And by attending these five sessions, you should gain a thorough understanding of the issues that matter to you. All previous sessions can be found on our website. And if you'd like to register for our fifth and final session of this learning series, Patient Rights 101, we are putting the link to, the reg to register in the webinar chat. And this session will be taking place tomorrow, June 1st at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so before I welcome today's presenters, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Everyone on the call is muted today. However, there will be opportunity to submit questions. To do so, please type your questions into the question bar on the Zoom side panel and we will read them out loud for you at the end. Please try to keep your questions as concise and clear as possible. And while we are trying to, we, while we are going to try to get through as many questions as possible, unfortunately, we may not get to everyone. And if you have outstanding questions following the webinar or questions that are quite personal in nature, please contact us at support at dyingwithdignity.ca and we will follow up with you individually. We will also be sending out a post-webinar survey that will pop up on your screen after the webinar. It will give you the opportunity to share your feedback. And this session will be recorded, so you will be able to watch it again later. So there's no need to take notes if you don't want to. And so today I want to introduce today's speakers. Uh, first joining us is Rochelle Busanen, is, and she is the co-founder and um, managing director of Being Here Human. She holds a master's degree in thanatology and is a certified thanatologist with the Association of Death Education and Counseling and has spent the last 10 years building community-based bereavement programs for hospices across Southern Ontario. Rochelle has also holds a faculty appointment at McMaster University in the Department of Family Medicine, Division of Palliative Care. She is a longitudinal, longitudinal facilitator at the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine and a guest lecturer in many of McMaster's undergraduate programs. Rochelle is also a faculty member at Western University in the Department of Thanatology. And Rochelle is a queer identified woman of North African and Middle Eastern descent and is a fierce believer that grief is our birthright. Also joining us today is Michelle Williams. Michelle is the co-founder and managing director of Being Here Human. She holds a master's degree in social work and has many years of experience, both personally and professionally, supporting bereaved individuals and those at end of life. She has been involved with grassroots organizations supporting communities who are living with housing instability, food insecurity, addictions, and inadequate access to mental health resources. She has a professional experience in the child welfare system, witnessing firsthand the harm of systemic racism and oppressive practices on marginalized families. Michelle is a woman of mixed ethnicity who identifies as Black. She believes that one's grief and loss experiences are greatly impacted by marginalization, marginalization and the intersections of identity. I am now going to pass it over to Kelsey to get us started. Thank you so much, Melissa, and uh, thank you to Rochelle and Michelle for being with us this afternoon. We're so glad to have you here. 
Um, so we did hear a bit from Melissa about your backgrounds and, and um, your professional histories and, and who you are, but I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about yourselves and what brought you to create Being Here Human. Um, Michelle, do you want to get us started? Sure. Um, so I would say, first and foremost, Rochelle and I, uh, you know, are bereaved individuals. So uh, that's sort of like the starting point for so much of what we do. Um, we met many years ago, um, and we were both working in hospice uh, in an area that had a huge amount of diversity. Um, and unfortunately, what we were seeing in the context of that hospice space was that although we were in a very diverse part of Ontario, uh, one of the most diverse cities in Ontario, um, we weren't seeing that diversity reflected in the residents who were occupying um, the hospice. And so, you know, we kind of had some questions about that. And one of the things that we learned pretty quickly is that folks don't really like it when you question systems and structures um, and they don't really enjoy having to think about, you know, these larger issues that, you know, we're all kind of navigating. One of them being that although we're in an, a diverse area, we're not seeing it reflected in the residents at the hospice. So, you know, very serendipitously, um, I was in the process of doing my master's degree. I met Rochelle and we realized that what we were seeing was not unique um, was not a unique kind of occurrence. It was sort of systemic throughout end of life and palliative care that there was sort of like this disconnect between, um, you know, the folks who were in, in need of end of life and palliative care or bereavement support and actually who was getting it. And so we kind of knew very quickly that we had a very similar orientation and worldview um, when it came to bereavement and grief and loss specifically. And we knew that it was something that we could, that could be done better and that we could actually offer something more reflective of what we wanted to see in terms of what the grief and loss landscape looked like. So um, I came into the work myself, uh, specifically, I came into the work about 11 years ago uh, and it was after the death of my mother and she died of a rare form of cancer. And um, my experience through you know, her end of life and the kinds of support I and my family received uh, going through that kind of prompted me to sort of reevaluate my life and what I was doing and uh, led me to go back to school to pursue a master's in social work uh, with a focus on end of life and palliative care. And what I realized very quickly was that although I was going into an area, uh, a field of work that was sort of steeped in uh, grief and loss. I mean, all of the communities, individuals, and demographics I would be working with would be experiencing some form of loss that I actually wasn't being prepared for it in any way. So there was no actual mandatory course for me to take at a master's degree level in grief and loss. And so I realized I was going to actually need to pursue those experiences to gain those skills on my own. And as I said, I was very fortunate to meet Rochelle at that time. And it was through those experiences that I was able to, to gain that education specifically in that space. Um, so that's a little bit about me, but I'm gonna send it over to Rochelle to share a little bit about her. Um, yeah, very similar to Michelle. I This was not the work or the career that was uh, I would have chosen or that I believed as a young person I would have had. Um, I had trained most of my life as a singer and as a classical singer. Um, I have an undergraduate in vocal performance and musical theater. Um, I studied in Toronto, in the UK, in New York City. Um, and someone who was really important to me in my life, um, someone who I loved very much, who also was a singer. Um, uh, died six weeks after my 25th birthday. Um, and it radically changed my life. It really, uh, yeah, just changed me in every which way a person can be changed. Um, and that really started a very, very deep and lengthy exploratory process for myself as to um, 
why we are just so crap at grief in our culture, like why we are just so unbelievably illiterate. Um, and it wasn't true. That's not a true statement everywhere in the world. Um, I traveled for a long time after Diane died um, in a lot of different places, a lot of different cultures, some my own, some in which I was a guest. Um, and we do a really unique job of messing it up here. It's not true that this is how folks relate to grief around the world. And so I started getting really curious about why that was, about whether it was by design, about whether it was possible for it to be done differently. And that kind of led to me returning to graduate school. Um, and it led to a, what is now, I guess, a 15 year career. I met Michelle just probably around my, the 10 year mark for me. Um, and I had been doing frontline uh, psychosocial care in residential and community-based hospices in Ontario for about a decade at that time. And uh, there were some things that I had noticed after 10 years of being at the bedside. Um, that weren't super cool with me. <laughs> and uh, one of the things Michelle already addressed, which is that it is an incredibly homogenous space and environment, and it is a really beautiful space for resourced white folks and not such a kind place for other people. Um, and the second thing that I really noticed over and over and over again was these um, ideas that we would share and hold and say that were true about grief, but that if you really scratched the surface, there was no actual engagement or orientation towards grief that was congruent with those sentiments. So, for example, grief is normal. Well, grief is normal, but every single program we have here is clinician led, right? Uh, grief is not time limited, but you can only come here six months after you've had a death, and then you can only stay on service for 12 months. And if at 13 months you still need support, then we send you off to a professional, even though grief is normal. Um, grief is not just death related, but you can only come here for support if you've had the physical death of somebody in your immediate nuclear, usually heteronormative family. Um, grief is a unique experience, but all you can access here is very traditional Western-based, pathology-based talk therapy or support groups that we know are only useful for folks who grieve intuitively. Um, so lots and lots of good chatter, but when I was in the field for 10 years, there was nothing that was actually uh, very original or unique in terms of practicing those beliefs. And so uh, I knew for myself um, that I really wanted to create a space um, where grief was not pathologized and really mean that, not just say that it's normal. Um, so one of the reasons we called the organization Being Here Human is because both Michelle and I often say, it's not enough. It's insufficient to say that grief is normal because that actually sits grief in juxtaposition to abnormal. And that's part of the same pathology based orientation. And so it's actually insufficient to say that it's normal. Um, it is more accurate to say that grief is human. And there's lots of things about being human that we don't like, that we could wish were different, that are highly unpleasant and painful and uncomfortable, but it actually still is the most human thing to experience. And so uh, the organization is called Being Here Human, and every which way that both of us orient towards the work, our content, our organization is this fierce, fierce belief um, that to grieve is to be human. So we don't even need to have the discussions about right or wrong ways, or is it okay or not okay? We just can leave that all, lay it all down because it isn't optional. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And, and Rochelle, your observations about what you've, you experienced, you know, working in death and dying and how, you know, there's statements made, but in actuality, it's like, that's that's the supports kind of speak to something that's different from from those statements so super interesting um i think you know just to dive into the discussion of grief a, a bit more what is grief and and you talked a bit rochelle too about you know um grieving the death of a person and and that's not the only type of grief and these sorts of things can we maybe delve into that a a little more and talk about what what is grief? So grief is, so we have a culture that where we don't actually talk about grief, right? It's not something that's discussed. We have a very death denying and loss averse culture. So inevitably we aren't also having conversations about grief and what it is and what it can look like. Um, you know, 
as human beings, um, we do this thing very involuntary, involuntarily, which is to attach, right? And we attach not only to people, but we attach to objects, we attach to ideas, we attach to roles and responsibilities, we attach to identities, we attach to places, right? And it's part of what we need to do as human beings to survive, to thrive, is that we need to attach, right? When we have those attachments severed, if we lose those attachments, then what happens is we have a response that is also entirely involuntary, and that's grief, right? So we describe grief as being an entirely involuntary response that happens in our bodies, and it affects us on all levels of our being and our personhood. Um, it affects us cognitively, emotionally, physically, um, existentially, sexually, socially, every aspect of our being in a person that is affected by grief. And it happens without our consent and without our participation. And so, you know, the reality about grief is because it's so involuntary and it has no, we don't have any sort of um, agency around how it's going to happen and what it's going to look like. It also means that we don't actually have a say in how it will show up for us. Right. So for some of us, when we have a grief response, it might look like something very physical. It might be in our bodies. It might look like aches and pains or nausea or headaches. And for someone else, it might actually look like fatigue and lethargy, insomnia. Like it can just be any kind of um, presentation um, and we don't get a, a choice in it. Right. So the idea that grief is something that we can actually control or we can actually um, have any, in any way manage or, um, uh, you know, manipulate in any way in terms of how we express it, how it's demonstrated or what it's gonna look like for us. That's kind of a false narrative that we often tell ourselves. And this is how we get sort of ideas about the five stages of grief and, or ideas about there being closure or resolution to grief. Um, and these are just narratives that actually don't fit the reality of what grief actually is, which is an entirely involuntary physiological response in the body. Thank you. That's super helpful. And I'm wondering, um, Rochelle, if you have anything you wanted to add to the, the broader grief discussion, but also if you could tell us a bit more about the different types of grief. We hear about anticipatory grief and the non-death related grief and I'm sure there's many others as well. If, if you could touch on that a little bit, that would be really wonderful. Yeah, it's actually, it's an interesting question and it, it demonstrates kind of our lack of literacy because we like to call things things and then say that they're so just because we said so, right? So saying I have closure or they have closure and it's a sentence and it's a great sentence. It's just completely fictitious because what we actually know from the data and the research is something like closure doesn't exist, that it's not anything that can be identified, measured, quantified in any way. So it's very similar when we talk about different types of grief. There's no, there's no difference between the grief that you might experience after the death of the loved one versus the grief that you experience what we call anticipatory grief. There's no difference in the grief we experience when there's been a physical death versus when it's a non-death related loss. If we have the bare bones definition of grief, grief is our whole being's involuntary response to a severed attachment. The thing that does shift is what it is we're grieving. If the, there hasn't been a physical death yet and the person is no longer cognitively present, then the grief we're experiencing is the same as the grief afterwards. What we're grieving is different. What that the cause or the source of that grief response may be different circumstantially. What also can be different is the cause of our grief, the circumstances surrounding our grief, uh, the disproportionate rates that some communities experience grief where they experience a loss and another loss and another loss before there's been any sufficient time to metabolize the initial severing. Um, so there's circumstantially, environmentally, geographically, there's lots of things that can make the experience different, but grief is grief is grief. Grief simply means that an attachment was present to anything and that attachment was severed and because of the severing the body has engaged in an involuntary response that we call grief great thank you that's that's helpful um i'm wondering if we can throw another term into the mix here and that that term is mourning 
Um, so Michelle, could you tell us what the difference is between grief and, and mourning? Yeah, absolutely. So we often conflate these two things, right? <clears throat> we talk about mourning when we really need, mean grief and we talk about grief when we really mean mourning. So, you know, just to reiterate again, grief is that involuntary response to a severed attachment, right? It's that, um, it's that physiological response to a loss that happens in our bodies on all levels of our being and our personhood. So that's grief. Um, and we don't have a say, we don't have a choice in how it will show up, what it will look like, how, you know, all of it, no say, it's just happening. Mourning, on the other hand, is what we do with all of that grief, right? And so Rochelle and I often refer to mourning as being our grief gone public. And that doesn't mean that it requires an audience or to be witnessed, but it's all of those sort of rites and rituals that we do um, outwardly to sort of demonstrate that grief. And it can, it can be lighting a candle, um, you know, holding a memorial, uh, running a marathon in the memory of, you know, you know, these are all sort of acts of mourning, right? And so that's the sort of the, the, the distinction between the two things. Mourning, we have some agency over, right? We, we can actually decide what, how we want to mourn that loss. Grief, on the other hand, we don't have agency over. It is involuntary. And it just happens when we have a severed attachment or we've experienced a loss. And so we can consider it in, those, in that way, whereas grief, we don't have agency and mourning, we do have agency. That can kind of be the key um, uh, point to make for folks to remember the difference between the two. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I, I guess we, we've touched on this a, a bit, but both of you have, I think. But um, so grief is involuntary. It just happens. We can't really control it. Um, we spoke about some of the ways in which that manifest in a way, you know, fatigue or whatever the case may be. Are there other ways that people grieve that are maybe less, um, you know, we think of crying, we think of being tired and not wanting to leave the house and that kind of thing. But are there other ways that people might be experiencing their grief that we don't think of quite as often? Yeah, I mean, of course. And I, I think that, um, what I actually want to answer your question with is the myth underneath it, because the myth that's underneath it is this idea that grief is a feeling, right? So how does it look? What are the feelings to look for? Rage, anxiety, guilt, regret, sadness, but all of that is still a myth, right? And the reason it's a myth is because grief isn't a feeling, which is not to say that we don't experience a myriad of feelings while we're grieving and that they're actually quite transient that what we feel at 10 a.m. might be very different than what we're feeling by noon. So of course we experience a plethora of feelings while grieving, but the experience itself is so much larger and all impactful and all encompassing than an emotion. And to kind of make the connection, the analogy I often use in our workshops is around birth, right? So when someone is birthing, a body is birthing or in labor, they have lots of feelings and the feelings are entirely dependent on where they are in the labor process. Are they three centimeters? Are they eight centimeters? Are they pushing? Are they at the peak of a contraction? Are they at a denouement of one? Are they in between? So there's lots of feelings, but nobody would tell a birthing person that all they need to do to resolve the pain that they're in is to find someone to share and express their feelings to, and that it would shift the circumstances of their labor. It would be absurd. We would if someone, while I was eight centimeters and transitioning, told me that all I needed to do was have like talk about it or feel, express my feelings, I would have throat punched them, right? And yet with grieving people, because we have this myth that grief is a feeling, that's how we get all of these really unhelpful points of advice saying you just need to feel it, you just need to express it, you need to meet it head on, you need to find someone to talk to, all of these things um, that may or may not be useful depending on a variety of factors. Um, so when I say like, how can grief show up? Yeah, it can show up really differently. Um, it can show up in Crohn's and colitis. It can show up in chronic diarrhea. It can show up um, in, I think of Cheryl Strade's essay, The Love of My Life. It can show up in really uh, reckless sexual promiscuity. It can show up in blowing through a lot of money if it's accessible to you. Um, it can show up in 
completely as we did for Michelle and I giving your life a 180 and going off and either traveling or disappearing or studying or immersing like it can look like all the the diverse ways that living a life can look is the same way that grieving a loss can look because diversity is a part of the species of being human thank you thank you for that rochelle and um i like how you brought up the the myth part and i wonder michelle if you could add to that what are some other myths about grief mm. that exist that you would like to debunk <laughs> with our audience today yeah so i think we we touched on some of them already um there are a lot of myths and misconceptions that we have culturally and socially about grief um I'd say probably one of the, the one of the biggest myths that we still have in our culture and we still hear it perpetuated repeatedly and over and over again is that there are stages to grief. There are, there are these five stages to grief. Um, that is a both a myth and a misconception about grief. Uh, grief does not follow a linear trajectory. It doesn't have a series of stages or phases that you have to go through. Um, and then on the heels of that particular myth and misconception, another big uh, myth, I would say, is that grief has a resolution or it has a time limit or that it has it comes to some kind of an end. Um, that's an unfortunate myth that I think plagues so many folks who are grieving and who may be years out from, from a loss and still find themselves um, experiencing quite a lot of grief and and feel as though you know at this point why isn't it over why haven't I had resolution why hasn't it come to some kind of uh closure uh so these are these are myths that continue to exist and they're sort of perpetuated um yeah so those are those are some of the ones that and I, I know Rochelle's got others that she could certainly uh point to in terms of myths that continue to, to perpetuate yeah, I just think the biggest one is that it resolves so that it ends. I saw there's another question in the yeah. chat about closure and that it implies that it ends. And that is the issue. That's why the word isn't accurate, um, is that, you know, when labor and delivery ends as an analogy, an example, parenting begins. And then you're in that road for the rest of your life. Even if you have a stillborn, even if your child, an adult child dies, you're then a bereaved parent, but you don't ever get to go back to the person or the body that you were in prior to that experience prior to becoming a parent and so the needs of parenting shift what a toddler needs is very different than a school age ch child very different than a college or university age child so it's not that the experience stays the same but an experience shifting over time is very different than saying an experience has completed and so grief is an experience that shifts in nature over time that needs the requirements what it means for you shifts over time but the idea that it completes uh would actually go against everything we know about ourselves as a species which is that we continue to age and develop and grow across the lifespan and so what it meant to me at 25 to lose my beloved is very different and what i was mourning then is very different than when i became a parent myself than when i got remarried then uh very recently i had an experience um in my own parenting life that was very similar to an experience she had when she was younger um and so there was a whole resurgence of mourning and grief of what that meant to now recognize that as a 41 year old and so we don't you know i always say i can be kind of crass about it but when people are like isn't it done or you seem great or you're remarried like you know it's finished you have closure i always in a quite crass way say well she's still dead and I will be in relationship to that fact for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life, I will never escape that fact or my relationship to that fact. Although it shifts what it does mean and what the quality of that relationship does shift. Do I think Michelle or I are in the same experience we were in year one or two or three after our loss? Absolutely not. In the same way that parenting our now adolescent children is very different than it was when they were younger but this idea that we're obsessed with in the west um which is deeply rooted in colonization it's deeply rooted in pathology-based models of mental health practice um this idea that things resolve or complete as opposed to things integrate and metabolize and digest continuously in a cycle across the lifespan 
is kind of this core misconception that we have. Um, and we go into this in a lot in our workshops um, uh, at Being Here Human around the idea that if we look at the life cycle of a human being and the mechanisms that keep us alive, there isn't a single one that ever completes. So meaning we need oxygen to breathe, we inhale, we exhale. That is a constant cycle we do until we die. If you look at nutrition and hydration, we ingest, digest, metabolize, eliminate, and then we do it again. We don't just eat or drink one time and we're good. If we look at reproduction, it's the same. So every major mechanism that we as a species engage in to keep our systems alive are cyclical. And grief is no different. And so it's a completely complete fallacy, this idea that this is something that completes and that that should be in some way the goal. And if we're not finding it coming to completion, that it's evidence of pathology. Yeah. I think what you said is really interesting too, just the different society and everybody's different viewpoint of um, looking at something as important as birth and how, you know, how we deal with birth as human beings. Um, but death, it's, it's a very different situation and one that we don't want to talk about and we don't want to acknowledge the, you know, physical um, responses that come along with loss, but we're a little more open to talking about um, birth and, and um, having those discussions. So very interesting. Um, I thought the other thing too, I wanted to maybe touch on a bit based on what you were saying, Rochelle, is the idea of relationships with a person who is who has died and how, um, I think it was um, Therese Rando, one of the grief researchers talked about that relationship um, that you continue to have with your your person after they're they're gone. Um, do either of you have, have any reflections on on that and how people kind of keep those relationships going if it's more of a personal thing that they just hold on to sort of within them or if there's something through their continual you know outward mourning that um, contributes to to keeping that relationship going. Hmm. I think, I think what's interesting about, like, I mean, I lost my mother over 11 years ago. Um, and I, I'm, as Rochelle said, I'm in relationship to that loss, but I'm also in relationship with my memories of her. Right. And the ways in which she influenced me as a human being, the person I am today, um, I am still in relationship with that. And so you know, it's, it's really, it's really interesting when you look at it from a more sort of cultural perspective, where there are actual practices within many, many cultures where um, when a loved one dies, their connection to that person does not necessarily immediately end in the way that we think of it here in the Western world. There are cultures where, you know, um, there are, there are actual, you know, uh, spaces in the home that are devoted to, uh, memorializing that individual. And it's actually central to their home. Um, there are cultures where anytime there's a meal prepared, there's a plate prepared for their beloved. Um, so it's a very, uh, interesting thing that here in the Western world, that we have this idea that when a person, if we're speaking about a death loss, that the person that we lost that at the point of their death, that our connection and our relationship to them also ends. And so I would say that that's not true for, for many cultures, and it's absolutely not true for many people. And I would say for myself, I still have a dialogue, you know, in, in my mind, in my memories with my mother, I still reflect on ways in which she influenced my life. That will continue for the rest of my life. And so, um, so the idea that my relationship to her is gone because she's gone is uh, also a narrative that, uh, that gets perpetuated here in the Western world particularly, but that isn't true uh, for individuals and it's certainly not true for other cultures around the world. Yeah, I'm going to piggyback off of that one and say, you know, most cultures around the world, it's worth noting, would meet the requirements for prolonged grief disorder that was recently established in our DSM-5, that the vast majority of cultural grief and mourning practices would meet those requirements. 
And I find I can't, I cannot say that every person who's experienced loss and is grieving outside of the colonized world is mentally ill. That's just an absurd statement. Um, and so, or even to think when we think of continuing bonds, you know, that first publication was done by Dennis Kloss in 1996. And we suddenly the Western world perked up and said, oh, maybe we don't have to sever from the deceased and move on. Oh, we're allowed to have these continuing bonds. And if you think of the arrogance of that, that we only even were willing to consider that in 1996 when a white man published it, given the incredibly rich mourning histories that other cultures around the world have and continue to have, um, we're really far behind. Like if we just look at it from an actual academic standpoint, we are so far behind. Our even research and understanding of loss is so far behind uh, the organic knowing and learning of so many other cultures across the globe. Um, so I think it's really important in part of being grief literate is to humble ourselves and to really have a really solid slice of humble pie to realize how much we have to learn from the rest of the world outside of our own gaze. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that's a good um, segue into a discussion about grief literacy and what it is. And I think you've both touched on why it's important, you know, based on what we've been hearing today about how um, we grieve now and how grieving is looked at um, in the Western world, but what is grief literacy? Um, if there's anything else you wanted to add about why it's important, that would be, um, that would be super helpful for us. Um, for me, like the definition of literacy is just competence or knowledge in a specific area, right? And so nobody, like I can ask you, I'm gonna make the assumption. Do you want to go get your root canal done by somebody who is not competent in dentistry? <laughs> Or literate in dentistry? <laughs> Do you want to go get your brakes fixed when they need fixing by someone who is not literate in the functions of automob automobiles? Right? It's not, this isn't like, you know, I know Michelle and I coined this term and we have our book coming out with the same title and it, it's, yes, grief literacy has become what our body of work is known as, but it's not also rocket <laughs> science. It's just competency and knowledge in a specific subject matter, this time it happens to be grief. And the reason that feels so important to us is because so much of the pain and the suffering that we have culturally around grief isn't from the loss itself at all. The so much of the pain and the suffering we have actually comes from our lack of understanding, knowledge, and competency around loss. So very similarly, we hear this often um, in the sexual assault survivor community, where people will say the assault itself, the sexual assault was traumatic, but what was infinitely more traumatic and compounded my suffering was the response to it. And we're in a very similar spin or experience with grief, where the loss, it's not to say the loss isn't painful, but if we actually had the competency and the knowledge about what loss is, debunks myths and misconceptions, accurate information about what to expect of ourselves and of those that we love who are in mourning. So much, like a boatload of the additional suffering would dissipate. And then we would do what human beings have done since the beginning of time, which is we would get about the business of surviving and continuing to exist and live alongside loss. We wouldn't waste years and years and years of our life trying to find the solution out of it because we would have been told from the get-go that that was never on the menu. It was just never a possibility. And so why grief literacy is important to us is because, you know, I think being here humans been around five, six years now, we've now trained thousands of individuals, of employees within various organizations, corporations, healthcare fields. And what we see over and over and over again is that very rarely, very rarely, once someone has completed our three levels, which is pretty basic literacy, right? That we don't hear, the only, we hear from them again because they're kind and they let us know how they're doing, but they get about the business of figuring it out themselves, that they don't need, you know, the best trauma therapist, PhD, blah, 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 in the land. Like that's not actually what's required. So much of the suffering comes from a lack of competency and knowledge. And once you gift that to somebody, once you gift them the information, it is incredible what humans can bear. <laughs>
And so that's why it feels important to us because it feels like this is information that was inherently human, that lots of cultures have done a really good job of sharing intergenerationally and ours has not. We have by design have been completely robbed of our innate knowing. And so I think a lot of what Michelle and I do is an attempt to try and restore that information, to pass it on, to share it with as many people as possible so that they can get about the business of living their lives with loss, not wasting their lives and the time they do have trying to get over it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Rochelle. Um, I just have a, one more question and then we'll turn it over to some of the audience questions. So um, Michelle, maybe you could walk us through this one and this is for supporting people who are grieving and it's a bit of a, a two-parter. Um, for somebody who is grieving, um, how would you, what would you recommend? What would you say um, when it comes to supporting someone who has experienced the death of, of somebody? And then also when, how do we support somebody who they themselves are dying and they're grieving, you know, their, the life that, that they're losing, they're going to die or the, you know, the things that they're not able to do anymore because their condition has, you know, progressed in such a way. So two, two different situations, but what would your um, guidance be there for, for being there for somebody in, in those situations? So, yeah, I mean, I think the complicated part about that question is that because so many of us do lack this literacy around grief and loss, that our ability and our capacity when we're confronted with someone's grief um, is also limited, right? And so because we are so mired in all of these myths and misconceptions about grief, it does make it challenging for folks to then step in and actually be really supportive of someone who is grieving. That being said, um, it doesn't mean that we can't uh, make that effort to, to be present and to be supportive of someone who's experiencing loss. What it means, however, is that we need to kind of step away from some of those myths and misconceptions. And I think most, um, most particularly is that when someone is telling us that they're having an experience, that, the, that we believe the experience that they're having, right? So that when someone says to you, um, this is my experience, this is, this is the response I'm having, um, this is what I'm grieving, this is what this loss has done for me, is that we believe them and that we don't, um, and, be, and you know, like I said, when, when I say step away from those myths and misconceptions, step away from these ideas that grief has to look a certain way, that it has to sound a certain way, that it has to present a certain way, um, that it has to have a time limit. Uh, all of these things that can actually, uh, when imposed or, or presented to the grieving person can actually you know, compound the experience and actually be quite harmful, right? Um, because we're not really um, acknowledging the experience that the individual is having. Instead, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put, um, we're trying to impose sort of socially sanctioned ideas about what their grief should look and sound like. Thank you for that, Michelle. Um, so I think we'll, Go to some of our, our audience questions. We have some that came in ahead of time, some that are coming in now in the chat. So thank you for everyone um, for sending those in. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, Rochelle, you said earlier about, you know, we have different supports in the community, like peer-to-peer um, -peer talking and that kind of thing. And um, some of these, these programs and tools might be helpful for some folks, but you mentioned that they tend to maybe work best for people who are grieving intuitively. I'm wondering if you could touch on what you mean by grieving intuitively and who tends to grieve that way and kind of what that looks like. Yeah, I can give a quick bit. It's a much larger theory, but folks can find it if they want. Kenneth Doka and Terry Martin um, have a really beautiful piece of research that they published. Um, it's now in a book called Grieving Beyond Gender. Um, and what their research showed was that there are two dominant styles of grief that exist on a continuum. So it's not a binary, it's a continuum, but that it, 
each polar end of this continuum are two dominant grief styles that are in quite juxtaposition or opposition to one another. Uh, one style of grief are folks who grieve intuitively. The other end of the spectrum are folks who grieve instrumentally. And ultimately what it means is folks who grieve intuitively, intuitively are folks who grieve uh, emotionally and whose grief is best metabolized um, via expressing and exploring emotion. So these are the folks that, yeah, going and finding a grief counselor or a peer, if you're, you know, had infant loss and you go meet other a bereavement support group for other parents who've had infant loss, those are folks who find those experiences meaningful, useful, connecting, because the reason they find it that way is that if grief is something that needs to be metabolized continuously over time, the expressing and exploring a feeling and the sharing of stories helps them to metabolize. So that's why they leave feeling lighter, feeling more spacious. Um, and to be really crass, it's very similar to like the digestive process. Like we've, we eat a great meal, it might be delicious, but it sits in our stomachs. And then when we eventually eliminate, we feel better, like we have some more space. And so I'll often say like, the reason those programs work for intuitive grievers is it's because they got to take a really good poop while they were there. And so they're feeling the benefits of that. And then on the other end of the continuum for instrumental grievers, these are folks who best metabolize loss either cognitively or physically. And so the expression of their grief will often be behavioral or cognitive. And so these folks would find a bereavement support group, for example, highly, highly distressing. Why? Because not only are they going in with their grief, they're now exposed to eight to 10 other people's grief that has in, come into their body and nothing in the experience of sharing or expressing helps them metabolize. So they then leave the group and they either need to go think, cognitively process or physically move their bodies to move through now these 10 other grief experiences that they've ingested. So we have a lot of um, bias in Western psychotherapy practices that towards intuitive grievers. And when people grieve either cognitively or physically, which often because of the nature of it happens in private, meaning it's not with others, that other folks have the audacity to assume that they have any clue or insight into the interior landscape of an instrumental griever just because they're not sharing it with you, right? So somebody might need to organize their home. They might be decluttering. They might be cleaning. They might be working out, going for walks, hiking. Other folks might be journaling, reading voraciously in private, researching. I went and Michelle, and we went and did master's degrees right, in grief. So there's lots of ways that it can look, but of course, from the outside, what one could very easily say is Rochelle and Michelle are stuck, they're in denial, they're not feeling, they're not expressing, I'm concerned about them. Is that based in reality? I don't know. It's just based in the myth or the assumption that the only adaptive or healthy way to mourn is intuitively or is via the expression uh, and sharing of emotion. And that's what we know from Ken and Mark Terry's work is that that isn't actually true. Uh, it's very similar in some ways, this sounds silly, but if I were to ask you like, you know, probiotics are really good for gut health, right? Super, we agree. And then it would be like, how do you get your probiotics, Kelsey? And maybe you said, oh, I have Activia, I have yogurt every morning and fantastic, great. I'm severely lactose intolerant. If I got my probiotics via Activia or yogurt, I would be in the bathroom for a very long period of the day. It's not because probiotics is bad. It's because our bodies metabolize dairy differently. So I'm going to need to get mine in a different way. And I will often use analogies around digestion like that for grief. It's how the, there's nothing, there's no inherent value in one way versus another way. There's just the learning and the literacy of what way does my body best metabolize it? And can I go about the business of participating in the kinds of activities that allow me to digest and metabolize most often? Um, because we have a lack of literacy, we don't do that. And then a lot of judgments gets created from either side. And then I see a lot of relationships, uh, especially within family units, fracturing after loss because the assumption is that my way is better. And then we start telling stories about the way that another person is doing it that aren't actually founded in fact, it's just founded in misconception. Yeah, that, that's a helpful takeaway. Um, both are normal and natural. There's nothing wrong with either. It's just people 
are different and um and there can't be that judgment right that that makes sense and you don't get to say i didn't choose to be instrumental any more than michelle did yeah. you don't choose it it's just as involuntary as grief it's this is the way i am and so i can fight it and think something's wrong with me and pathologize myself or i can just go clean out my fridge and feel better when i'm done yeah absolutely that's great um so a question for you michelle um so we just went over you know grief is is human and and there's nothing wrong with with grieving um but how would somebody respond to somebody who's dismissive of their grief so somebody is you know taking away what they've learned today recognizing whatever i'm going through this is normal i'm dealing with it my own way whether it's cleaning or group therapy or whatever um but what if there's somebody in their life who is dismissive of of their grieving and is telling them to just let let it go to stop you know going mm -hmm. through whatever that process is mm -hmm. let them go yeah uh, yeah <laughs> that's right i was actually gonna say that um uh yeah i think that i think this happens a lot to bereaved folks um and it's one of the reasons it's one of the ways that grief impacts us socially right so that what happens with a lot of bereaved folks is that they have a significant loss and they learn very, very quickly that other people are really uncomfortable with their grief, with their outward demonstration of their grief. Um, and then they get a lot of this messaging, oh, well, don't you think it's time to move on? And maybe you should just let it go now. And hasn't it been enough time? Um, and so the reality is, is that regardless of whether you're being told by other people that it's time to let it go and shouldn't you move on, it's not going to change in any way the grief response that you're having. If anything, it's going to absolutely make the experience that you're having that much more harmful and maybe even worse for you because it's not being acknowledged or accepted by other folks, right? And so oftentimes what ends up happening is that bereaved individuals start to feel really isolated. They start to feel misunderstood. They uh, are become very aware that folks aren't willing or able to acknowledge their grief. They become very very aware of the fact that their outward demonstration of grief is making people uncomfortable. And so that a lot of bereaved individuals kind of begin to perform, uh, perform being okay, perform being fine, which Rochelle and I like never want to hear it. You're fine. <laughs> Nobody's fine. Right. Um, so people start to wear a mask and they kind of begin to hide who they are as bereaved individuals. And the unfortunate part of that is that you do need to be able to have those outward expressions you do need to be able part of that is mourning and if you feel uncomfortable mourning your loss beyond a certain point in time then you will not be able to metabolize your grief and that is just a reality so we have a lot of people who are walking around with unmetabolized grief because the external messaging that they're receiving is that it's time to let it go, right? Yeah, I also really think like, it's not for everybody. Like if somebody is dismissing you and if somebody is not a safe person, don't take it to them. Yeah, like it actually, they're giving you the information you need. It's not your job to convince them. It's not your job to waste any of your spoons capacity or energy on having them validate you. Just find someone else. Like find yeah they just like they what to me that shows over and over again is they haven't proved worthy of it and so take it elsewhere but i um yeah i, I just would not waste a moment of my energy trying to convince somebody that what I, my own experience was real there's actually a really good question here that i uh i, I don't want to skip over a whole bunch of people but i think it's one uh, I'm really fixated on it because I feel like it's one that Rochelle and I get a lot um, and it's one about grief and trauma. And so there's a question here that can grief stricken people be diagnosed with PTSD? Um, yes. And I think the, the, the issue that we have with that specifically is that oftentimes uh, folks conflate grief with trauma and they are separate things. And um, grief is not inherently traumatic, but you can have grief as a result of trauma. So yes, you can be a grieving person who's diagnosed with PTSD, but it's not necessarily that the grief itself is what's causing the trauma. 
Um, and another thing that we often talk about when we when we have our grief literacy workshops is that you know new losses resurrect old losses. So if you are experiencing loss and you've had previous losses, then absolutely that new loss is going to make you reflect and grieve previous losses. Um, and so they talk about the way in which um, PTSD lives in the body. Um, certainly certain circumstances can, uh, can resurrect previous traumatic experiences, but we wanna be super clear that grief itself is not an inherently traumatic experience, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you for that. I think that's important to, uh, to clarify that. So thank you for, for doing so. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. Uh, I thought that what would be great is if the two of you could share a little bit more about being here human. And for any folks who are on the call today who want to learn more ab about what you do and, and maybe sign up for some of your offerings um, to share a little bit more about what how they can do so and, and what that looks like. So you do it quick because we're taking the summer off. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Michelle and I uh, have recently been offered a publishing deal. And so we will be taking all of July and August off uh, as a writing sabbatical. So uh, usually once a month, we offer our uh, grief literacy certificate. The certificate is six hours of training um, divided into three workshops. So each workshop is two hours. Uh, level one would be one evening from 30 to 830 the following week, level two, and the following week, level three. Um, and then you get a grief literacy certificate when you complete all three levels. Um, there's only June. So if you're interested for this kind of calendar year, then June is when you would want to sign up for. I think we begin next week um, because then we will be taking July and August off completely. Uh, and we the certificate likely won't be returning until mid-fall. Um, so just to have that in mind. But the kind of the core of what we do as an organization is this three level um, grief and loss, uh, grief literacy certificate program. Um, we do offer some one on one support um, in a program that we run called Safe House. Um, but I would say it's not by any means, some folks come and they'll see us for a short period of time or they have specific questions that they want to, you know, chat with us with outside of the group setting one on one. Um, but I wouldn't say it's you know, by any means our bread and butter. Um, yeah. By far what we do is uh, we offer publicly to folks to sign up, but most often we go into large organizations, corporations, uh, universities. Um, we do a lot of private contracting to go in and to train employees within organizations um, how to be loss literate. And I'm just actually adding in our, you into the chat here, for folks to find us online, we are at beingherehuman.com and you can visit our website and you can learn a little bit more about um, what we do. Um, another piece of the work that we do, and for those of you who work within organizations, is that we actually do work with organizations and provide consulting um, and education for HR departments and we do staff-wide training um, et cetera. We even have done in the past um, where we do grief support for frontline workers within certain organizations who have experienced a lot of vicarious grief um, and who've been impacted uh, vicariously uh, by their clients with their losses. Uh, so that's sort of uh, another piece of the work that we do as well. Excellent. And congratulations on the book. I look forward to, to reading it. And I'm sure many of uh, many of our supporters on the call um, will be ordering a copy as well. Hopefully um, 2023. Perfect. <laughs> All 2023, it'll be on shelves. Yeah. Perfect. That sounds great. Um, well, thank you both so much for being with us today. Um, learned a lot. I'm sure our audience learned a lot as well. And um, as mentioned at the beginning, we do have our final session in this series tomorrow on patient rights. So please do sign up if you haven't already. Um, Michelle, Michelle, uh, we're so appreciative of everything that you shared today. Uh, good luck writing and um, stay Thanks, cool Kelsey. in this heat wave. I know. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Take care. Yeah.